So, I was just given an extra half hour that I didn't know I had, because I was told you I've already covered uh, long maintenance, so fantastic. So, um, what I'd like to do is, uh, well, let's go ahead and finish on our pruning, and we're going to talk about tools uh, that we use at the trade, and so forth. So, this is kind of the, the cuts that we were talking about yesterday. Since we have an extra half hour, I'm going to ask a question. Okay, please do. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, the water. Oh, oh, the water. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that's a real good question. Um, if if you're maintaining them like that and, and filling them like they're supposed to be, they're fantastic. Uh, what I've seen happen, is, like in our building in uh, Hillsboro, they put these gators around and then they filled them one time and then they didn't come back. and they didn't, they, and So they sat on there until I took them off. Um, that, that wasn't my job, but uh, I just, so if you're, if you're going to properly maintain them and, and fill them and use them, great to get it established the first year. After the first year, you don't need them anymore. So is there the potential of creating that microclimate issue like you're talking about with the tree wraps? Should you keep it up in the winter time? Absolutely. I mean, it depends on when you establish it, but yes, if, you know, I would not leave it over the winter, you know, because the trees do need winter, you know, if you're planting them in the fall, um, and you put them on, then, you know, they, they need less water in the winter anyway. So, you know, that may be that I'll just water when needed because that's usually when we get our, our, you know, rain in the fall anyway. So, thank you. so that the limbs are not older, they will have no need to cut, okay? And, and that's what I tell them, I say, you know, if you, if you want to, to manage it yourself, call the power company and tell them that, okay? Don't, don't keep a secret saying, well, I'm keeping it nice and tidy and everything else, and then, and then they come out and, and bush hog this, yeah. Yeah, they do. And I, I just saw some uh, on Ethel Cedar Grove Road yesterday, and I, I couldn't believe it. They, they went through and they cut the sides of them, and then they went and they cut the tops of them, and there are cedars, and I said, there's no greening that's ever going to come back there, because it's, remember how we talked about if you cut past the green uh, on certain trees that they won't come back, I said, you know, they, they've ruined those trees. Um, and matter of fact, I was, um, when they started cutting in Orange County, uh, I got a call, a hysterical call from a, from a client that says, hey, they, they, they did it, they did, they did it, they did what? <laughs> he said, um, I had these beautiful, beautiful uh, laurels out in front of my house, and they came in with a mowing machine and just mowed them off. Yeah. And so I went out there and I measured it, and, and, I, and I did an assessment and said, hey, this is what I see. Uh, and, I, and, and so I got a, got a call from the company that said, hey, you know, how did you come up with that, that dollar amount? Or how did you come up with that number of trees? I said, well, this is a density. The density of what I would normally plant, or plant along there if I had planted it. And he said, well, how do you know that's what the density was? I said, I don't. They're all cut off to the ground. So the only thing I can see are stubs. So, <laughs> um, and so uh, there was a court order over that um, wow. that was, um, was pretty nasty, I think. Uh, but the guy got some compensation. So, yes, sir. Of notification, it's it's a hey, we're we're cleaning the site we're cleaning the roads. Wow. I think so. Durham County is. Okay. Okay. Don't yeah. have right of ways. Yeah, exactly, and, and that's technically that's exactly what they're doing is they're cleaning the right of way. Right. Yeah. So, and most people don't realize that that the the offset 
It depends on where you are in the county. Some offsets are 50, 50 feet from the center of the road and some are 30 feet. So you just gotta know where you live and what the offset is. And if you look on the map or you go out there and you measure, you say, wow, I didn't realize that, that my mailbox is, is in the right of way. Oh, oh, I didn't realize my, this, remember that, um, that uh, magnolia tree? It's in the right of way, okay? Um, and so technically they can come and, and they can do anything to that. But what I do is I try to prevent that and I'm gonna show you some pictures here in a few minutes of, of great myrtles, uh, right, wrong place, right tree, wrong place, okay? Because um, they're right under the power lines and I'm gonna show you how, how I fix those. Okay, uh, let's get back to it. Okay, again, we're looking at the, the three-way cut. The first cut is on the bottom side. It's figure out where your end cut is gonna be, okay? So your end cut's gonna be over here. So the first cut, it's between there and the tip, and then you go further out, cut up here. It breaks down to this first cut, okay? It removes the weight of the limb, and then you'll go and you'll do your final cut over here. Okay, now again, bridge fork bridge right here. You can see it there, 45 degree angle. That's what this is, okay? And then it's straight down. So it's outside the collar. See the collar, the very top of the collar is right here. Okay. And just a couple more pictures showing the 45 degree angle. Okay. Um, now when you do prune, you want to make sure that you have somewhere for the energy to go that you that you've taken off. So if you'll notice, there's a little bud here. So you wanna cut maybe half an inch out past the bud. It, and this is again is an end cut. Okay, if you look at the angle, see how it's at an angle? Why do you think that is? The water will run off. So the water will run off. So right here, the water's gonna set right on top and cause rot. And then here, it's a little bit too sharp because it's literally below this node. See how that bud is right there? And the angle's a little bit steep. Okay, look at this cut. This is called a flush cut. Remember, remember the the, uh, the collar? This is actually cut right next to it and the collar is going, you can sit that down. Oh, okay. Okay, do we use this, this uh, paint sealer? We use any kind of thing. And, and why is that? Does anybody know why? That's exactly right. The, what we found is these companies sell this pruning sprays and, and these paints and stuff like that. But what we found is, is by applying it, you're actually trapping in moisture, you're trapping in that sap that's trying to escape. Um, if you let the tree do it, if you prune it correctly, the tree is gonna do what it needs to do. It's gonna protect itself, okay? It's gonna heal at that collar. So no need for this kind of stuff. We, so we don't recommend that. Okay, we're going to talk about some pruners. Um, who, knows, who has pruners? Everybody has pruners, right? Okay. I carry a pair of pruners, and these are called bypass. Okay, I'm going to pass around a couple sets of pruners. I'm going to keep mine, okay? And the only way I keep them is I keep them in a holster, okay? If I set them down, I lose them. So um, I'm going to pass around a couple pairs of the bypass pruners are designed, well, I've got, a, I've got a bunch of pruners here. Okay, bypass pruners have a sharp side on one side and then they have an end, they have a flat side. So when, the, when you cut, they're actually cutting from both sides, both directions. It's kind of like a, a really sharp pair of scissors. There's another type of pruner out there, it's called an anvil. I'll show you that right here. The, you've got a sharp blade that comes right down onto a flat anvil. And if I get these open, this is a, this is a type of anvil. Okay, so I'm gonna pass these around. You can take a look at the anvil type. We do not recommend using the anvil type of pruners. And the reason for that is 
if you've got a if you've got something like a, a, a flat anvil and you put a sharp knife against it what you're going to do is you're going to mash it on the back side okay and damage the limb whatever you're cutting so that's the reason we don't recommend the anvil type um i don't have my loppers i left those outside but anyway um loppers are nothing more than than hand pruners except with a long handle and I wanted to show you this type there are some loppers out there that you think well, we're gonna get some really really cool because the handles extend right so now I can really get up there whether it be loppers or you know pruning shears right well the issue is these handles when they're, they're fully extended, you, you see how far I have to open it if I'm holding it right here, if I'm holding it short, okay? But whenever I fully extend it, now look how I have to open it, okay? So it makes my reach more dangerous to be able to get that extra six inches of length. I have to open it twice as wide, so it makes it more difficult possibly to open. So, when would I use something like this? What kind of shrubs? Okay. This is something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, prove it with a chainsaw. <laughs> um, something like this would be used for, for, for really small leaves. Remember the topiary that we saw? Uh, like the boxwood, something like boxwood or yopon holly, something with really, really small leaves. Because otherwise, this is like a pair of scissors and it cuts it. Um, you're trying to cut a lot of it, very small stuff. Um, but you end up doing a lot more damage if you try to use this on something else. So the, the, hand, the hand pruners are the best way to go. You can, can really get some fine work. It takes a little bit longer, but uh, it, you'll have a much better result. Yep. Are you going to get to that? Uh, well, electric hedge, that's, that's the, the, I wasn't really going to talk about that. Um, the electric hedge trimmers are nothing more than this, except on steroids, you know, as you cut across. But again, it's the same type of thing you want to use it for is uh, small leaf. You don't want to use it for anything else. Or, you know, uh, grasses, pampas grasses or something like that, that, you know, whenever at the end of the year you bundle them up. And we talked about, you know, cutting those with electric trimmers would be great for something like that. Okay, um, saw, <clears throat> unfortunately, my saw went walkabout the last time I did a demonstration, but um, I do have a saw here somewhere. Stand there in the floor, I think. Keep looking. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Huh? Oh, I, I see it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Okay. <laughs> What is the difference between this saw and this saw? Any idea? Okay, this is called a bow saw, okay, because it looks like a bow and arrow kind of, right? So this, this guy works on push and pull. So if I go forward, it's gonna cut. When I pull back, it's gonna cut. This saw, the pruning saws are designed so that they only cut on the full stroke. So as you're pushing, it's not cutting only on the pull stroke. If you'll notice, there's a hook at the very end. What do you think that's for? To stop. To stop is to keep your butt from falling out of the tree. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm being silly, but as you pull back, yeah. um, you have a tendency to, your strength is coming back, but when you push, you don't want to have, have to push because it's if you're in, in an awkward position. But the hook has really helped me <laughs> to keep me from falling because I about lost my, <laughs> my balance um, and, and most of them do have and you'll notice this one has a scabbard on it so saws do come in different different lengths different sizes uh, different uses a, a good saw like this is worth its weight in gold um, I did a presentation and, and literally it walked away <laughs> so uh, that's okay that's okay Um, there's a couple
couple things when we talk about pruning, um, like when you're pruning fruit. Uh, specifically blackberries, raspberries, there's something called floricane and promicane. Does everyone know the difference? What, what, pro, what is promicane? Okay, promicane is the first year's growth when you have blackberries, it comes out of the ground, that's the primary cane, called promicane. It will not produce berries. What produces berries is the floor cane. It produces a flower. So the first year is the promocane, and it converts over to the floor cane the next year. So once the blackberry produces berries, it won't produce again next year, the following year. So you go in at the end of the season and you cut out all the floor cane. But the promocane, which is, is this year's growth, the new growth, will be next year's flowering growth. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, for, uh, and that's specifically blackberries and raspberries. Uh, we don't do raspberries very well here, so when people ask you what variety, I tell them, you know, I, I've not been very successful. I've got a couple raspberry shrubs at the home, at home um, that I'm experimenting with, but I'm, I'm told we just don't have enough chilling hours to grow raspberries. So I'm just trying to prove that point myself because people tell me that and I just I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> so, okay. Okay, when not to prune, late summer or fall. Okay, stimulates growth, and uh, so the hardiness is, is at risk in the winter. So you want to cut in the winter and, and in the heat of the summer. Now you can prune, you can prune lightly in the summer. And so where, when are two exceptions? Okay, light pruning can be done in the summer, but what are the two exceptions? Safety. Safety, okay. And disease. disease or dying, you can do that any time of year. Okay, um, and then again, makes sense, drought. You don't wanna, it's gonna stimulate growth, so you don't wanna have, stimulate growth when you're in, in a really dry spell, okay? We already talked about this. Okay, we were talking a few minutes ago in, during the break about, um, about figs. So I'd like you to take a look at the, this is this is a big next to the building, okay, and this is the same fig tree, big shrub, okay, and so this part up here is actually this picture again. So can you tell me what's what's the difference between this part of the plant and this part of the plant? Okay. stem. Look how green this is. Okay, this is this is new growth from the, the from there to the tip. That's one season's growth. Okay, and this is this is old growth. Okay, and I don't know if you can see this, but if you look at the wood, see how you got figs on this, right? But on this new growth, you have nothing. There's no figs. Okay. Uh, let's see if I've got a better picture of this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this again is the left side of the, of the fig, fig plant. No, I'm sorry, that's a different fig. That's a different one. Okay, going back to it. All right. The reason there's a big difference is because of sunlight. Where I put this in my yard, uh, there's a big maple tree uh, by this building, this my neighbor's building. Um, it's, it's hanging over part of of this tree, so it's shading it out. And so it does not get enough sunlight to produce figs. The right side, it, it produces figs all year long. I mean, big, beautiful figs. And so what I've got, gone and done is I've literally <laughs> taken my saw and cut everything on this side that's in the shade because it's not, not gonna ever produce any figs for me. The right side does great, the left side doesn't, so I just remove it. And you cut it close to yeah, yeah. It, it looks like half a shrub. Because <laughs> you can see these big, the big limbs that are on the left side where I've gone and just whacked it off. Wow. Okay. Um, this is one of those, uh, I took a brick and laid it over. Does any of you, do any of you know what something called air layering is? Layering? And basically what you do is you take, you take a stem from a fig 
takes your knife. Imagine this is big, okay? And you just you go around the outside and you cut cut the stem. I'm just doing this real fast. Okay. And then I go in and I scrape it. Then what I do is I take some, some uh, 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 rooting powder and I put it on there and I put some sphagnum moss in, in water and soak it, get really wet, and I, and I wrap it around it and I'll put some aluminum foil across it and I'll just let it go like that. What happens is all the energy from this tree that tries to go down actually creates a root system there in that sphagnum moss. And then at the end of the season, you know, I'll go and I'll check it, I'll feel it. And then if it feels like it's got a really neat root system, I'll kind of pull the aluminum foil back, take a look at it and see how good the root system is. And then once it's got a really nice looking root system, I'll go here and I'll cut it off down here. And then I've got a new, um, new shrub, new uh, okay. thing. thing and shrub. you'll just plant it like that. Yep, absolutely. That's so cool. Okay, and so the, the size, you don't want to use you want to use wood that's about the size of a pencil, a little bit bigger, and you want to look kind of um, the brown, the brown uh, green, where, right there at the transition zone <coughs> to do that. Um, uh, every year, every year at the uh, agronomy lab, Souls Lab in Raleigh, they've got this huge shrub tree. I mean, it's massive, and every year they've got uh, they they go out there and they do their uh, air pruning. And I, I, I noticed it this morning as I was coming to work because I dropped off some samples. And so, um, so it's time for me to go and do some air pruning on mine. Okay. Again, look at the amount of figs that are out here. You can see that it's quite, quite numerous. This is the right side. I mean, from here on out, you've got big figs, figs up there. And again, on the left side, there's nothing. Okay, let's talk about the crepe murder. Okay. Uh, the Japanese beetles absolutely love them, um, and you'll you'll go out and you'll see, you know, where they've skeletonized the, the leaves and everything else. But uh, there's a lot of different varieties that grow short, medium, and tall. Um, I remember I told you about the maple tree that died on me. Uh, I'm going to replace it with something called Rocket. I think it's called Red Rocket, but it's a crepe fertile, fast growing, beautiful crimson red. Flowers, I'm very excited. I just haven't found a source yet. So if you find one, let me know, <laughs> okay? Um, but uh, I've got Natchez at, at my home, okay? What's going on here, okay? This is what we talked about earlier, crepe murder, okay? They just went through, but I'm gonna show you on a, in a further slide about where it's considered acceptable, okay? So how would you go about pruning something like this? Okay, remember how we talked about you go deep and you take out a limb here. You take out one of these big, you know, four inch limbs at the base and you pull it out and it opens up the center. So this right here, after it's been pruned, looks something like that. Does that, that's the same, that's the same plant. See the building in the back? That's the same plant. Okay, versus something like this. Okay, remember how we talked about crossing branches, yeah. okay? So this one would, would be a good candidate to come out. So why do people decide to do crepe murder? Like um, they're in a hurry. They're doing commercial work. They're, they were told to do it. They just don't know any better. When you say pull it out, like the center ones, are you literally pulling it out or are you just cutting it? You, you cut it and you have to cut, set. you may have to cut sections and then you're getting, getting it out of the center. Okay, so you're opening up. Okay, let me go back to it. Okay, see how, how open this looks? There's a lot of space in here. That, this limb right here is this limb right here. Okay, so what they've done is they've gone in and selectively removed some of the main stalks all the way down back to in the center mass there. Would you, would you change out the ones that are that grow higher or, or, or lower? You just want, you want it to, a natural appearance is what you're after, okay? 
And I'm going to show you something that, that I, I did out of necessity, and, and you'll understand why in a minute. Now, what about this? Is this acceptable? No. I would argue that this is correctly done. This is called holy. Okay? okay. It's called holy. P O L L I N G. Holy. And so what they do is they literally, um, it's, like, uh, it's like your hand, they create balls where, where they shave just the hand. So they're taking the fingers off. Okay, that's kind of why it looks like that. Okay, it's kind of like the, like the whole hand. Okay, and I'll show you another picture here in a minute. Okay, you can see that this has been improperly pruned. They, they come in here at some point and cut everything about here. Can you see that yes. back there? So if I were to go in and properly prune these, I would go in and I'd cut sections, give different heights, different layers, layer them, and open it up. Okay, so pests and diseases. Um, we've all seen the powdery mildew. Um, what, uh, what about um, sooty mold? What is sooty mold? You guys know that, right? Okay, it's honeydew. It's, it's from these little insects right here, these aphids that are on the back side of the leaf. They're sucking it, they're piercing, and they're causing it to bleed. And so what happens is, is that, that ooze kind of falls on the leaves below, and then mold, the sooty mold, actually grows on that, that sweet nectar that's, that's uh, falling on the leaf. But that's what this is. And then powdery mildew, it's something that we, we live with because where we are in the country, hot, humid, moist summers, um, and we just have to live with it. Unless you want to treat, now you could use a fungicide, but not highly recommended. Okay, size ranges again, five feet to 35 feet. Beautiful uh, bark, uh, winter colors for the leaves. Okay. Kind of the one that I'm looking for, the rocket. Oh, that's the rocket. Whoa. But again, just some different varieties. Okay, bald cypress is another good selection. Um, we actually they planted some of our other building, but I just don't know that that guy's going to make it because of the soil conditions. It just really, really, they didn't do a very good job planting it. A river birch. Look at the bark, isn't that gorgeous? Okay, poor wind resistance, okay? So if you wanted to create a barrier or something like that, you know, these are trees that I would not use. I mean, they're great in, you know, as, as in a dense forest. Poplars are great uh, lumber trees, but again, they're just not real sturdy. Um, the red bud, these are some of the red buds. Look at the colors that we were talking about earlier. I absolutely love that one. I think that was called Sunrise or something like that. Sunrise. The yellowy blue. Oh, yeah, that's the leaves. That's the leaves. That's the, that's yes. Lot. It's gorgeous. And then uh, Ashley was talking about the purple, purple color. Yeah, I think it's Easter in my case. That's what I have. And then here's one that has the leaves that are, that are uh, modeled. No, 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 those, th those are not. Oh, okay. These are not. I don't have a picture of that one. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I have a red bud that I've been trying to figure out. I have three of them, and every red bud in the whole thing has the same color. And it's like a purple red bud. And I, I cannot figure out why. Okay, but it does bud eventually? Yeah, it's only now and everything else. Oh, okay. I suspect, well, um, Bob has been sending pictures, but also we're trying to leave because we also, we have a, there were a lot of street trees planted that were not our native eastern redwood. They're actually a hybrid with an Asian redwood because they're a little bit more resistant. They have a glossier leaf and they tend to be on a slightly different schedule. So it's not going to because it might not be as green. Well, Correct. Look at it, or it could be. Yeah, or or else. what I was going to suggest yeah. is that, that it could be a problem with the root system. Uh, which I just 
Um, so, so what you can do is, first of all, the simplest thing is bring Ashley, Dr. Ashley, a, a leaf, and I'm gonna keep. <laughs> Keep busting on her. No, I love her to death. But anyway, um, so bring it, bring that. The first thing, rule out the simplest things first, and then if if it is a, the, the native variety, then I would look at maybe taking a soil and, and root sample, uh, and then you, that could be sent to the diagnostic lab, plant disease and insect clinic, and then they would could tell you if it's got some kind of a root rot. Okay. Okay, and then that may cause it. Uh, to, to, to delay. So are the farmers a light wouldn't have anything to do with it? It could, it could, but usually red bud, they, they bud out first, okay, before they even leaf out, okay? And so that's early, it's early spring, so light is not usually an issue, of even because they're normally, our native red buds are found as an understory in the shade. shade. I think it's called uh, sun, Sunset rising, or? Rising Sun. Rising, rising sun, sun, yeah, okay, Rising Sun. Rising but it's, sun, right. it's absolutely gorgeous. It's got like three different colors of leaves. It's green and yellow, um, just beautiful hues. And then the and, uh, ruby one, the yeah, it's, it's, it's Ruby Falls. Yeah. Ru ruby Falls? Ruby Falls. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely love dogwoods. Absolutely love them. Um, again, they're an understory tree. Uh, there is a disease that that has been discovered recently called street dieback. Have you have you seen it yet? Not yet. Um, well, I know it's here. As a matter of fact, we found it in uh, Hillsboro. Uh, a farmer or a gentleman, a client, had actually purchased some trees from Tennessee. And initially, it looked like powdery mildew, but they were they just just collapsed. Uh, and we I took samples, literally sent it to the lab, and found out it, uh, they they weren't ready to tell me at the time. It was before they even identified what it was, um, but that's what it was. It was just a streak, streaky streaky dye. Um, I don't know. Have you heard of a resistance? I know they're just trying to trying to get their arms there around it. Well, there's a disease that's, that's in the high, higher yeah. elevations. Um, and they say we don't have it here. And initially, that's what I thought we had. Um, and, and, but it says it's 1,000 feet or above is where the elevation line is. It's kind of like it doesn't. Uh, and so down here, I said, no, it's not. So what is it? Um, and I see a lot of other dogwoods that have the tops are dying out of them. And, you know, the older, more mature dogwoods. But the streaky dieback is... Uh, apparently a new disease, relatively new disease, and it's in, uh, it, it was, I think, started in Tennessee, Kentucky or Tennessee. But a lot of different varieties. Uh, some, some diseases, uh, let's see, the anthracnose is probably the, the most prevalent. This one I absolutely love, the cornucusa, the absolutely gorgeous. My neighbor has one. I'm, I'm wanting to go over there and kind of steal half of his when he's, when he's not looking. <laughs> but I just think it's just gorgeous. Um, but a lot of beautiful beauty and, and things you see around and just, just observe it. Japanese maple. Yeah, these are pretty resistant to a lot of things and a lot of insect pressure and so forth. Um, have you seen much disease with Japanese maples? I mean, I've seen a little bit of powdery mildew, but that's about it. Uh, and, but I did lose my Japanese maple. It was a blood good. Um, and I suspect I've, it was a, a soil pathogen. That's why I think it died. And the reason I think that is because a shrub right next to it died this year, which was a, an evergreen. So wow. you don't normally have, you know, uh, well, something... How would you get that? From uh, what? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It could be a bit of shovel. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I could have spread it, brought it home from work. I just don't know. Okay, so here's my cell phone number. 804-318-7493. Um, don't think you're leaving, because we haven't talked about tools yet. <laughs> okay. So do you want to turn the lights up? Sure.
Okay. So I brought a, a, a whole collection of tools to show you guys. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is, is PPE, personal protective equipment. When you're out in the yard, a good set of gloves is always good. Uh, as you notice, this, these have reflective strips on them. They're high visibility, as well as my shirt. Why do you think I wear this when I'm outside? Well, not this one, because it still has a tag on it. But why do you think I wear stuff like this outside? Well, it's, it's more than that. Um, whenever, whenever I'm out, I'm usually doing a lot of things in the yard. I've got my backpack blower on. I've got my hearing protection on. And, I'm, and I've got my, my eye protection. Okay, let's show you these here in a minute. But I've got my eye protection on, and, and, and I can't hear. So when I've got my blower going, I'm, I'm out blowing the leaves, and my back's in the road. Somebody else can see me, right? So I could be I could be hit if I were not highly visible. So that's why this is a considered protective equipment. Okay, who can tell me what this is? <laughs> it's a bandana. Okay, exactly. But you 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 dip it in water. And it's got some beads inside that swell up, and it just releases water, and you tie it around your neck. These are I wear glasses, so they always fog up. If I wear you know something like this. And I'm hot and sweaty, you know, I can't see after about 10 minutes because I get all fogged up. Well, these actually have a, a wire mesh. It's not glass, it's a wire mesh. So I'm going to pass those around so y'all can look at those. Um, I ordered those from, a, from a, a forestry service. I saw this lady who was, uh, who was an arborist, and, and, she, and I said, that is the coolest thing. And I said, where'd you get them? And she told me, and I said, well, I've got to write that down, and I did. I ordered uh, two sets. Yeah. I'm sorry? Recently I went to the optometrist and they told me to not spend money on PPE for my glasses. To wash them, leave them in jars. Okay. Everything they use to clean the animals when they, and that's I approve. Yeah. Once a week with Dawn, you wipe them and they don't talk as much. Well, I use Dawn with my glasses, but I, I usually wear my glasses on the top of my head because yeah. they're, they're bifocals and I can't see far and, and near yeah. the same time. Sunscreen, okay. Um, it, it's a personal protective equipment. It, I have a, a disease that my skin pigment is gone, and so I burn real easy on the back of my neck. So sunscreen is one of my PPEs. Additionally, um, insect repellent is considered a PPE. And, and from I had alpha gal for about three years. That's where I couldn't. I, I got tick bitten, and I couldn't eat meat, uh, beef, pot, beef, pork. Uh, lamb, I can eat any, any mammal animals. I can only eat fish and chicken. Because of the tick bite, that's right. So had I been treated before, you know, treated my clothes or whatever, um, that may have prevented it. I am now cured, okay? Uh, but I'm, I was told recently by someone who has alpha gal that they have just identified that chiggers may be a vector uh, wow. for alpha gal. Oh my God. So, so just hear me out. That's I don't know that for a fact. I just from someone who has recently who has alpha gal said they have recently attributed it as a vector. So just understand that uh, it's not been proven yet by me. Uh, so who can tell me what this is? Is it a regular shovel? No. What's What's unique about it besides the hole? What's it What's it for? It's for drainage. That's exactly right. Okay. This is called a mud shovel. Okay. So how many of you have dug a hole and, and realized that my gosh, I, you know, I can't get the mud off. It sticks to it. Well, that's exactly why uh, it, it has the air air gap. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. Where did they get that? Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Work. You just stick it in there. 
it stirs, right? You twist it down, and as you turn, you pick it up, you move it. So what would I try to aerate? What? Somebody said it, I heard it. Compost, okay, this is a great, great thing in the garden. And the beauty is I can change the way the fork positions to make it either a bigger, bigger bite or a smaller bite. How, how difficult is it to get it into the ground? It's, well, it depends on how hard your compost is or whatever you're digging. Okay, if you've got a garden that's, that's uh, really compacted. It's, compacted, it's tough, but, uh, and you'll probably break because these are aluminum spikes. So, um, okay, what's this? Okay, where, what do I use this for? My compost, right? Okay. Um, the thing about the thermometers is most of them, most of them have a dot on the side, and it tells you where the temperature is being taken. Okay. The long reach thermometer is what, what I keep in my compost, so that whenever, whenever it starts cooling down, I know it's time to stir it. So, I use a bottle. I, I leave it in my compost. Okay, because otherwise, if it were rain, it would fill up this gauge. So I just take a take an old water bottle and just leave it in there. And so if I want to see what the temperature, I look and then cover it back up. While you're working on tools like that, do you have something or something that you use to stick in the ground to see the um, distance that you've watered? Uh, I <laughs> we do have some tools like that. Uh, in the lab, we use those for on the farm, but it's not really a probe or anything like that. It's something you put in the ground, you leave it there oh, okay. to see what the soil moisture is. So there's no, there's no tool. I'm sure there is. I'm sure there, there are some anemometers that, well, not anemometers, there are some probes that you, that you put in there uh, that can monitor it all the time and see what the water is. So um, I'm gonna show you a really cool tool here. First, this guy. It's called an uprooter. So what do you think it's for? Uprooting. Uprooting. <laughs> That's right. So if you've got saplings, new saplings, <coughs> you take you take this thing and you put the put the slide this in the jaws. Okay? And you're doing this standing up. So you put your foot on here just to, to, to start closing the jaw. Oh yeah. Okay? Because it's, it's designed to stay open. So it literally is in the ground. Crushes and then you pull. <laughs> this one's the very heavy. I bought it. I bought the heaviest one because I wanted to be able to, to, to take out you know, three inch. You know, Yeah. So I'm yeah. just stuck on that. I'm like, <laughs> like, how do you get it out of there? 
No, no, no. I'm, the, the shrub that died in front of the, the, the maple that died, mm -hmm. I'll pull that out. Yeah, that. for that. I mean, it's a big shrub, about four yeah. feet around. I'll yeah. cut off so I can get down to the main stem, and then I'll pull it out. Okay. okay. You wouldn't just cut it at the base and then go around it? I could, but I think I, I think just using something like this and get all of it out as opposed to trying to put a chain around it and rip it out. Okay, you can tell me what this is. A matic. This is the magic tool. Okay. Um, I will tell I will tell you that the newer tools like this one, uh, this one has a plastic handle, makes it it's lighter weight. But I'll tell you, they're not as good as the older tools. So I, this past weekend at the Antiques show, I bought another Matic. I paid six bucks for the head, and I paid twenty dollars for a new handle. Okay, just if you'll notice how flat this is, this is not supposed to be flat. It's supposed to be bent, uh, and so I put so much pressure on it, it, it straightened it out. So that's why. Uh, but this is a great yard tool. It's a good for prying. It's good for for tearing down decking. It's good for any kind of hardscapes. For wedging, I mean, you, there's so many, so many practical things to use a matic for. So that's not the one you got at the end. No, 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 that's that's not. Okay. Um, it's a nice digging tool, cutting tool. It's got sharp edges, front side, back side. You can use it as a saw. Um, you can use it as, as a digging tool uh, between between bricks and stuff. You know you, how you get grass and stuff. You can cut that out. What just, is it called? What is it called? I don't know what this is called. <laughs> it's called a fisker. <laughs> this is a fisker. Um, I got this at Home Depot, and I just thought it looked cool and was intimidating. And I can send my my ten year old out, one year old outside, say go have some fun. Um, Ashley told me not not to talk about chemicals. So so I said I won't talk about it. I'll show them instead. Um, I, I was out with a farmer yesterday, and he he had a problem with buttercup. And I said, well, you know, you're gonna kill. It. You can either spray this. But he's got horses on it. He said, I really don't want to spray it. I said, well, well, you know, you could you could look at your application method. Um, there's something called a wick applicator, and basically it's a it's a hollow tube that has a sponge on the end of it, uh, and it's it holds the liquid, and so you, you can go and apply it just to the buttercup, okay, or just apply it to the dandelion, or you can just apply it to whatever. But if you're using glyphosate, okay. This is actually glyphosate. This is my my latest and greatest uh, Roundup tool. Yes, yeah, my. <laughs> this is, this is truly a man's roll-on, right? <laughs> okay, it even has a an application button here at the bottom. You just push it, and you see the gel, yeah. kind of like a gel applicator. Um, but this is an, another method. <coughs> But we were talking earlier about uh, about application methods, and um, as we talk about the uh, the wick applicator, what can you do with with glyphosate? You know, a lot of times you go out and you want to do cut and paint. How many of you ever heard of cut and paint? Okay. How many of you have ever, ever been played bingo with the dabber? With what? With the dabber. With the dauber. Okay. <laughs> You can go to Amazon and order a dauber, the big size, you know, a six ounce dauber. What it, is that? It's, it, it has a, 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 a felt tip on the end of it. It's stuff what they use to mark the, the bingo slot. Oh, yeah. Or, okay, yeah. that's called a dauber. Is it foam on the end? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so what you do is you take glyphosate, Roundup, oh, full strength, wear it gloves, and you pour it into a dauber. You put a couple drops of dye in. Red dye, blue dye, whatever is your fancy colored dye that you want to use. And then put the top, you know, the, the, the felt tip on it, and then it's got a screw on cap. So you take that, that puppy and you put it in your back pocket, and you take your, your saw and you go out and you, you saw it, you pull the dauber out, you take the lid off, you paint it. So now you've just seen what you've treated, 
you put the lid back on, you stick it back in your pocket, and move on. Move to the next one. You know, that, so that's that's a quick 10 minute, you know, using glyphosate uh, product. When you said the, uh, the first buttercup problem, you mean it's just the mass of it in the grass where the horse was growing? Correct. Why wouldn't he just let the horse just drink that? Because no. it's poison. Oh, it's toxic. Yeah. God. Buttercup is toxic to horses. Okay, um, there's a couple other things I'd like to talk about. Um, when you look at chemicals selection, okay, when we talk about, when I, when I say glyphosate, what do you think of? You think of Roundup, right? Well, Roundup is not, is the, is the product, it's a label. It is the company, it's, it's called Roundup, okay? Um, there is Roundup 365, okay? And what does that mean? It, if you look at the active ingredient, it means it controls controls the weeds or whatever for 365 days, yeah. okay? Normally, glyphosate, it doesn't do that, okay? This one is concentrated plus. So why does it have the word plus on it if it's just glyphosate, okay? It means it's got something else added, right? So this one, this plus is designed, it probably has here. I don't know that for a fact, but, but look at the active ingredient. When somebody says, says I use Roundup, don't just assume that they're talking about, about glyphosate. Think, of, think there's other things that can be added with it, tape mixed together. Um, there is something called an ester, and then there's something called an amine. Okay, if you have a chemical that has an ester, okay, it means alcohol. Okay, if it has amine, that means fatty. Okay, think of fatty acid, right? So amine is a better product to use in the summer, and the esters are designed mostly for winter use, okay? And the only reason I'm telling you that is because we've had problems with something called volatiliz volatilization. And so that's when a chemical has been, well, exactly, when a chemical has been sprayed, the heat of the sun volatilizes it, and it picks it up yeah. and it moves it over to the plant that's right next door. Okay, volatilization. So the esters with alcohol used for the winter when it's really cold, and the amine use those in the summer. Okay? So that's all I'm actually I promise you I wouldn't talk about chemicals. So that's about it, okay? <laughs> uh, a couple other tools. Who can tell me what this is for? So measuring water. water. It's for what? Measuring water. It's not for measuring water, it's actually for soil sampling of a pond. Okay, something that you can do is make, oh. get, get a can, drill some holes in it, put maybe one small one at the bottom, and then I take this and I, I take some tape, I take it on a long stick, I reach out in the pond, and I scoop it up, let some of the water drain out, and I put it in a, a bucket. And I do that about 10 different places around the pond. Okay, get that muck, pour the top water off, stir up the mud, and then let it dry out, put it on a, a cardboard. But Something easy you can make, something easy, something real useful. How do you use that data? You take that, that goes to the soils lab. Yeah, I and that. They use that to, to tell you how much lime to put in your pond to change your pH in your pond. And I always take, I tell people, I say, um, I, I, when I go do a pond visit, uh, they, I say, you know, I recommend that you, so, you so, solution sample your water to see where you are. And I said, at the same time, go ahead and collect a, a pond sample because if, they, if it needs lime, they're gonna, they're gonna tell you to come back and do a soil sample anyway. So they just usually submit it at one time, and so it saves them a lot of time. Can you use lime in a pond where there are fish, yes. frogs, and things like it, that? It's, it's, it's both. They can put calcium, you can uh, use lime, um, and sometimes ponds need fertilizer because they, they don't have enough pond weeds in it. Okay. So sometimes you need to fertilize your pond. Okay. Tell me about these. Are these good? Are these bad? Good. Why? Because it helps with digging when you're planting. Okay, but the point I was really going for is what is the composition? They're stainless steel, right? Okay, stainless steel. I um, always recommend that you get a, a good set of stainless steel uh, tools to, to be able to use in your um, garden. What's the make of those parts? I'm sorry? What is the make of those? I, I, these are aims, I think. I don't know. I got Okay. What's this for? 
it's fertilization or, or uh, I'm sorry, not fertilization. It's for uh, insecticides uh, for trees. You put it on the end of your hose and for your orchard, your apple orchard, or whatever. Um, here's another one. I love this one. <laughs> Who knows what this is? You're never supposed to use a lighter to, to light these. Um, real easy to kill weeds with it. Um, let me just show you. set yourself your house on fire. <laughs> I learned by experience. Uh, I have a big one, okay? I mean, it's got a, it's got a cone about that big around, and it, I pull it, it's got a, a butane, butane tank for my gas grill, and it's strapped to a dolly, and I pull it, and I go along, and I burn along the fences. It works really well, um, until my son came over and says, hey, Dad, you, you know, you, you got a fire going over there. I looked back, and all along the fence, <laughs> or I, I didn't, you know, I used to, I'd burn it, and I'd step it out, and I'd burn some more, and I'd step it out, and one that I just, I guess, didn't step out, and it was burning right along the fence. So you got to be careful with this, but um, works great. Okay, always good, always good to have in the garden, a pair of scissors. Um, I can't iterate enough about yeah. using, you know, a holster for your tools because you can always find it. Okay, here's another key tip. This is one of my master gardeners taught me this. She says, hey, go and get a stripe, get a piece of tape. It's, it's reflected tape. And it, it took me the longest time to find it at Home Depot, but they did have them. They were, they're only short trips about that long, and they're pretty expensive. I said, do I really want to pay for this? Well, one tool that you save with a pair of reflective tape um, is well worth it. So what she did is she wraps it around, you know, a small section of her tool, whether a, a hoe or whatever, and then whenever she sets it down, if she forgets or she loses it, she drops it, um, she comes out at night with a flashlight, and you yeah. can find it. Very, very clever. Okay. Um, you've got different hoe types, different reach. Um, this is something that we haven't talked about yet. The pole saw. Okay. Again, this one, this one cuts on the full stroke. Okay, Cut, cuts on the full stroke. But this one also has a. You can use it like this. You hook it over the limb if it's small enough. And it's a pair of loppers, okay? Uh, the material, okay, see how the, the loppers work? Okay, you can come look at it. But the material is fiberglass. Why do you think it's fiberglass? Lightweight, that's part of it. But it doesn't, it's, exactly, exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, conduct, conduct electricity very well. But this one can be sized, you know, shorter or longer. So, okay, here's another cool one. You have to tell me what this is. It's a broad fork. Um, it, it's a broad fork, okay? And instead of using a tiller, remember the question I asked at the very beginning? Are you a tiller? Are you a stirrer? Okay? You step on here and you pull it back. You move it six inches. And forward, step on it, pull it back. You don't pull it, you just pull it about that far. Okay, what it does is it opens up, air gets it, can penetrate down uh, to the end of the ground, and it allows, it allows you to till your soil without 
I haven't spent a lot of time. Okay, I know we're out of time. So, so anyway, um, there's some other tools up here if you're interested. I'll be happy to stick around. Um, and this is really a cool one as well. Okay, I bought it at the Dollar Tree, and it's invaluable. Okay, so anyway.